You're not being fair. You came into my house. You made me sit in that fort. Now Donna said my dad is here. Hmm. What? How? It doesn't matter. You should go home. We'll get Jasper later. But things are really hard to see. Welcome from Lee Faithful. We are back to cover episode five of season three entitled The Light of Day. Before I get started there, I wanted to give a big thank you to all of you who have subscribed, liked the content, shared it. I'm on the road to get 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year. I'm very close. Right now, I'm about at 8,300. So every single like, every single subscription, every single share helps tremendously. So I want to thank everybody who's doing that. For those of you who have tuned in for the first time, I'm covering every single episode this season for season three of From. Also bringing in interviews with the cast as they become available. So with no further ado, I wanted to give you a special interview I did with Scott McCord a.k.a. Victor. Good. Hey, Scott, nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. Going well. Uh, so I wanted to say, just congratulate you first. You've been doing a phenomenal job this season. We're going into episode five this weekend, getting the big reunion with your dad, uh, Henry. I wanted to go behind that first scene because, you know, your character has so much apprehension feeling like the child in him was gone and that his dad wouldn't accept him. Mm -hmm. But when you guys came together, he reverted almost back to that innocent child that yeah. he thought was gone. How much of that was on the paper and how much did you improvise that with Robert Joy when you filmed that scene? The amazing Robert Joy, huh? It's, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was, I think it, it was, it was there in John's writing, or at least that was the impression that I, that I got, you know, the, the dialogue in that moment, you know, uh, there's just two lines in that scene. It's him saying my name. And then, and then I, I say to him, uh, the, this line of, uh, uh, I didn't know how to get back home. And that was when I first saw it on the page. I mean, that's, it was just so loaded to me. So incredibly loaded to me in terms of just, I think the, the, yeah, I mean, an obvious regression, because I think, you know, there's 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 this thing of of that I've been talking about this lifetime that's been lost between these two people that I feel like Victor has feels this responsibility for in a way, you know, that that now that he's on this, you know, this plight of opening, you know, getting this belief, opening it and, and trying to get into his memories and 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 to do something he has to remember at the same time. His father's arrived, and I think he's trying to acknowledge this failure or something. You know, like I failed, I failed you. You know, and then from that point moving forward, uh, it adds to Victor's plight. I think in terms of not only just saving everyone, but saving his father in that lifetime that was lost between them. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. then this person, let's go to Sarah because you know yeah. I've heard me interacting with you a lot. Yeah. And the, because of her age, you start to think, okay, this is a brother sister thing. But just yeah. her posture, the way she's talking to Victor, I'm getting like a motherly vibe from oh, their season. Really? Yeah, that's that's it. Not that. yeah, just even uh -huh. her clothes, the way she looks, even she was in the background uh -huh. of that scene with you and Robert Joy. I'm wondering if you're getting that from her too this season that she's coming into more of a, a mother figure, even at her young age. It's a that's a great that's a great observation. I feel like I feel like, yeah, there were, I think there's moments with her that feel, I mean, to me, truthfully, at the beginning, it was a very brother-sister kind of a thing. Going in the fort, you know, sharing secrets and that kind of thing. But there is something, I think, that develops that goes further than that. Yeah, where you get those, but where she's able to come to me and be the person I think that she wants to be in that moment to help me. Like, we were helping each other, I think, you know. Uh, Across a certain th threshold, uh, and there's a lot of trust there. And yeah, there's definitely there's a consoling, a maternal consoling thing there, definitely that I think that I I felt. Um, but I would say it feels more. It's always felt more brotherly, sisterly with me. But that's also that could just be the relationship I have with Avery, who's such a wonderful actor, right? Right. And uh, and she's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of we have a lot of we have a lot of laughs on set together yeah 
Now let's talk about this this puppet that you're after, Jasper. Oh, yeah. um, before then, I kind of looked at it in my mind that we have like a Wizard of Oz situation where there's just one hand behind everything. Yeah, right. With this puppet, now I'm thinking we're like in uh, Twin Peaks territory where there's like maybe multiple entities out there. <laughs> With your reading halfway through, what is your gut telling you? Are you thinking there's just one source or are you feeling like there's multiple sources with multiple agendas? going on here it's a great that's an awesome question because you know of course we don't know anything none of the we don't know we don't know the story we don't know the over the whole arc of the thing we don't know the ending we don't know anything uh we know what's given to us script by script and as john griffin the creator always says is he'll always give us what we need to know at that moment at that particular that's all that's that's what he'll give us i um uh, i would lean on the side of this is just me I mean, the further we get along in this thing, I don't know. I think I always go back and forth, but I feel like there is there's multiple. I would I would think multiple things happening, and maybe even converging, and maybe even warring. I don't know. I like uh, that. Again, I we don't none of us know anything, and you know, every now and then the gang gets together and we theorize and we we throw stuff out at each other, but. I don't know. I, and then this, I'll say this. Every time I think I'm onto something, <laughs> I think this is for all of us. All of a sudden, the next script comes out or something, and I go, oh, it's totally wrong. <laughs> you know, it's going actually in a completely other direction. So there's that, too. Yeah. Well, Scott, I appreciate your time. Looking forward to Victor's journey over the rest of the season. I think you're safe, but I'm going to keep my fingers crossed because you know yeah. these night creatures. But I'm looking forward to seeing how his journey turns out at the end of season three. Man. Yeah, hang in. There's a great, great episode 10 coming up. Oh, I certainly will. Scott, appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so big thank you to Scott McCord for sharing his time to give some insight into Victor's journey in episode five. So we won't start there. Let's start with, I'm going to start with Boyd, because for me, Boyd has the best moment of this episode and also the worst moment of this episode. So that's a good starting point with his character. Let's start with the good. The good for me is that Good old Dale, with his stupidity, gave Boyd a boost, kind of the biggest boost he's had so far this season regarding his leadership. And what I mean by that is because of Dale's recklessness and getting himself killed, actually embedded in the um, bottom of the swimming pool or side of the swimming pool, that is the biggest boost that Boyd could have got for his leadership abilities with the town. You know, everything's been fractured this season with losing Tian Chen, with Randall saying in front of everybody in Colony House that Boyd left him. Now with Tabitha coming back, I feel at this point we see a lot of doubt coming into uh, this episode with Boyd's leadership. People starting to doubt him, people not believing that he can keep them safe. And it almost feels like a mutiny is on hand, even with Randall out of the commission. It's just like nobody has any trust in anything Boyd says until Dale got himself killed. That is the best example of why you need to listen to Boyd. And Boyd let everybody know. He went on a little rant saying, this is what happens when you get stupid, when you don't listen to me, when you do things without thinking them through, you get yourself killed. Everything I'm doing here is to try and protect you from that happening. But I can't protect you if you think you know everything when you absolutely know nothing. And we see everybody there with their heads down, acting like little children. I think those of you who are on this um, review who have been in leadership positions, you know, a big part of leadership is managing personalities. You know, in the, in the sense, it almost becomes like managing children, depending on the group of people that you're dealing with. And I feel Jade had the best line of this episode where he mentioned, when you have more than three people in the meeting, it's almost useless. You know, it's in one ear and out the other. And after the meeting, after all the doubt about uh, trying to go home and where the boy left Randall, that shut everybody up because now they see that there's consequences for not listening to the boy. And the biggest consequence is losing your life and having a brutal death. Seeing Dale like that, they realize there's nothing that can be done with him, done for him. They realize it makes absolutely no sense that he ends up stuck in the side of a swimming pool uh, suffocating and being crushed simply by going through the tree. So it's not as simple as going through, the, going through the tree like Tabitha did, and now I'm home. It's completely arbitrary, 
and there's really no way to plan for it. And that's the best example that they can see. And it harkens to what Boyd said after the meeting, where he said the reason why he felt the night creatures did this to Randall is so because they won't feel safe in the daytime. They can look at Randall walking around scarred up and maimed and realize that they're not safe, that there's no pretending in the day that they can just go about their regular routines and they'll be okay. That's a constant reminder of what's coming at night. And I feel Dale being there because there's really no way that they can bury him. And I don't think there's really any way that they can cover him up. Anybody that walks through that main road in town will see that that's a clear ex example of what will happen to you if you don't listen to Boyd's leadership. You will end up with a painful, brutal, humiliating death. So I think Boyd has had the biggest boost of this entire seasoning as far as his leadership goes by having Dale just stupidly run off like that. So kudos to Dale. I think his death, he's done more for the town than he's ever done while he's alive. So RIP Dale nonetheless. Uh, I will say this. I think Boyd still let them off easy. I love a Boyd rant just like anyone else does. He's done it a little bit. Uh, the police officer Acosta got a little bit of a little bit of it as well. But I feel he could have went even harder, you know, criticizing everybody at the end of the episode. He still kind of took it easy on them. I really wanted to, him to lay into them a little bit further. And maybe he was going down that route if uh, Donna didn't show up. But he was right on point in saying what he needed to say to them and telling them to relax. And he really stopped the potential mutiny from happening because it was slowly building, even with Randall out of commission. I do like that they didn't hot shot that into immediately Randall saying that we can't trust Boyd. He's out of the picture for the moment. But all that doubt is still festering around. And I think Dale getting killed eliminated most of that. So that was, to me, Boyd's best moment of this episode and showing his leadership in the fallout for Dale's death. Uh, as far as the bad that happened, I feel he missed the biggest opportunity of the episode in getting the cop, Acosta, on his side. Now, we realize there's good cops and there's bad cops. A lot of cops can be very domineering, uh, not listening to other people, but uh, Acosta did not come in like that. She came in very remorseful for her actions. She's not one of those people that believes absolutely in her power and is trying to overrun everybody there. She's trying to learn and to integrate herself and to be an asset, realizing that she came in very wrong, not believing Tabitha. And there were extreme consequences for that and three people dying because of that. So she is trying to get back on the right path and to be an asset to this town. She immediately went to Boyd told her, told him that I'm so sorry for what I did, but I do have this idea. We see what's happening with the town and the fear that's festering with everyone. The best thing that we can do is to try and get everybody under control and to give them a purpose. Very sound advice, something that Boyd, you know, he's thought about be before, but with everything going on, I feel he's went against that. She gave him perfect advice. And that to me showed me that she's willing to be an asset or could be an asset in this community. And another thing is, you know, in any society, we instinctively look to people who are in leadership positions. You know, police are one of them. Judges are one of them. You know, people that we bestow that power on to keep order in the community. So as long as she has that uniform on, I think people will instinctively listen to her if she's backing Boyd. Boyd saying, hey, this is the agenda that we're going on. Acosta reinforcing that would do a lot to keeping the town under control. But Boyd wasn't thinking like that. He was still upset about Nikki dying, what Randall said, feeling that pressure. And because she's an outsider, that's the person he felt comfortable lashing out at, you know, telling her that you're basically essentially your stupidity is what got us in this situation. And you're not fit to give anybody any advice, you know, completely dressed her down. The only thing that could have been worse was doing that publicly in front of all the other townspeople, which he was on the way to doing last episode when um, Nikki died. It seemed like he was going to grab her and either tell her this to everybody in everybody's face or throw her out of the colony house, one or the other. And if Donna didn't step in, that was going to that was going to happen within the next couple seconds. So this episode basically continued those feelings he had for Acosta. And I feel like that was a big, big mistake. That is somebody that would have been an, a tremendous asset for him and his leadership. So is she going to take that line down? No. This to me reinforces the theory that I came up with last episode is that she's going to unite with Randall once Randall gets up and running 
uh, that's going to be the faction that builds against Boyd and his leadership. So I think that was a huge mistake. And you see his face right after he said that to her and she left. You can immediately tell he realized that that was a mistake. I shouldn't have last, lashed out at her like that. But because of pride and ego, he wasn't willing to run after her immediately and say my bad and you know, we'll talk about this later or try and soothe it over some type of way. But you can tell he was not completely happy with the way he reacted like that. So keep an eye on the As long as she has that gun and is wearing that police uniform, she'll instinctively get people to follow her. And if she follows Randall's uh, leadership, like I think, with uh, another faction being created in the town, they are going to be formidable, even with Dale passing away. I don't think it'll take too much for people to gravitate towards uh, Akasa. If she keeps with those ideas she talked about as far as giving people a purpose. So keep an eye on Akasa, where she moves, who she aligns with, especially when Randall has completely recovered and is back out there in the field. The next big thing that I really enjoyed here was communication. That's the thing we always complain about with the from people is lack of communication. When they're seeing visions, when they're eating rotten food, they decide to not tell anybody. Communication needs to be happening. And I felt that this was another episode where we got a lot of good communication. Let's start with Elgin, seeing the woman in the Komodo, the rotten woman. He finally told somebody, which is Julie, who was there to steal a little bit of weed from a Fox, I think I was Fox Mustache, he basically revealed to her what he's been seeing. He's not sure what the woman wants. So I thought that was really cool that he's finally admitted that to somebody, somebody outside of Colony House at that. So my next question is wondering, is Julie going to start seeing this woman now? And if so, is Julie going to be, I guess, more equipped to try and ask questions and figure out what the woman wants. So are we going to be having like a buddy-buddy mission? Because it seems like people pair off in these seasons. You know, this last season, it was Boyd and Sarah. This season, it's Sarah and um, Victor, and possibly Victor's father now. And now I think we're going to be getting a little bit of Elgin and Julie, which I think is good. They are both, you know, close to the same age. So it makes sense. So I wonder how the um, the decaying woman is going to incorporate Julie into all these visions. That's the only reason I can see them kind of coming together like that and having those scenes. So let's keep an eye on that and see where it goes. Uh, speaking of the decaying lady, which may or may not be Fatima, we see Fatima finally admit now that she's been eating the rotten food to Ellis. So what is the next step going to be? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I know they've checked on Fat Fatima before, Christy and Marie. I don't remember if they have an ultrasound or anything that's equivalent to that at the clinic where they can check on the baby for sure to make sure the baby's growing properly. But that seems to be the next step. You know, Ellis is going to push for that to try and figure out what's going on, even though Fatima's going crazy and saying that there's no solution, there's always a solution. So once they start looking into that a little bit more, I'm interested to see what they find. I know some of you have speculated that Fatima is not really pregnant or is not pregnant in the traditional sense, which I think makes a lot of sense, honestly, because she hasn't, there's no baby bump or anything. So something is in there, but something that's probably not human, that's either going to turn her into a night creature or a night creature growing in her that's going to kill her. One of those type of outcomes. But I just like the fact that it's being communicated now. But there is a consequence that comes with communication, because obviously this needs to be kept amongst a a small group of people. This is very confidential information. But because she's now told Ellis, I think we're going to have a game of telephone where it starts to get expanded, possibly through our colony house, this information, and falls into the wrong hands. Um, now, who the wrong hands can be, that can be maybe Acosta, that can be maybe Randall, but somebody's going to find out this information about her eating this type of food which is not food, but eating rotten food. And maybe that leads to her getting kicked out of Colony House. You know, my big theory is that I think Ellis is going to have to be the one to tragically put Fatima down when she turns because she did mention the rotten food, but she didn't mention you know, eating uh, parts of Nikki's corpse. Now that gets out, then people are going to go hysterical. So I, even though I'm thinking Ellis is going to be the one to put her down, it wouldn't surprise me. That could be another angle if maybe Randall's faction, when it gets up and running, whether that's Acosta or Randall himself, 
maybe they're the ones that kill Fatima when she gets close to turning. And then next season, we have this full-on battle of Randall's faction against the town and Boyd and Ellis, because, of course, Ellis is not going to be um, in his right mind seeing anyone else kill the love of his life and his child. So that's another potential outcome, even though I think it's more poetic and better storyline-wise if Ellis is the one that has to kill Fatima, mirroring what Boyd had to do with his mother being Boyd's wife. So we'll see where that goes, but keep an eye on who else finds out about this news about Fatima's bad eating habits. It's going to get out to somebody else besides the confidential people, which would be Christy and Marie. So keep an eye on that. We have a lot of mysteries, I think, that have been raised. I'm not sure if they're going to get resolved this season, but they've been brought up and I'm wondering about. So I want to get you guys' takes on that. The first thing is Jade and Tabitha going to the tree and looking inside the bottles. And the bottles all had uh, numbers written on them, uh, four numbers on each uh, notice or letter put inside the bottles. I tried to do a little bit of Googling around. I tried to see if maybe those numbers were lighthouse coordinates. Uh, that turned out to be um, a dead end because lighthouse coordinates normally have just two numbers, so four wouldn't fit. Uh, I also looked at possibly any type of uh, grids that use uh, four numbers, and there is a four-digit grid, and that's normally used with square locations, I guess, square maps to try and pinpoint exact locations. So maybe that has something to do with it, but that seems a little convoluted for this type of show. But that is the only thing I came up with and that when I was Googling around. And I think the simplest solution would be that their numbers representing people trying to remind themselves of the year that they arrived to kind of keep track of things. So I think all those numbers represent, you know, somebody arrived in 1972, 1980. I guess we have to look at what the numbers actually say. If there's numbers on there that are past uh, the 1900s, then probably that's a dead end. But I'm thinking I'd be shocked if there's people that go back beyond, you know, to, to let's say 546 AD or something like that. I don't think it goes that far back as far as how long people have been in the town. But we can't put that past anybody because those um, statues that were uh, created that were guarding the um, cabin town that they came, came across with all the food, those can be ancient. Those could be preceding, you know, the Civil War era uh, people that vision, uh, Jade has been seeing as far as the visions go. So we don't really know how long people have been in that area, but those are the only kind of ideas I've had about what those four-digit numbers may be. So I'm open to any thoughts you guys might have or theories about that. The other thing would be there's some other type of entity that's walking around at night in that area that is not a night creature. And that what I mean is when Jay and Kenny and Chrissy have stayed there overnight, they heard somebody moving outside, heavy footsteps, sounds like something big and monstrous and probably not human that's been walking around enough to rattle the cabin. What is that moving around? To me, it's not a night creature, and to me, it goes back to what I was saying last uh, review last week, where I talked about we're moving into a Twin Peaks type of territory with the show, where instead of thinking there's like a Wizards of Oz situation where there's one hand behind the curtain with everything, it's multiple entities with their own agenda, kind of like an ecosystem of spirits. So the next thing is determining whether the spirit is uh, benevolent or malev uh evil. And we will just have to see. Um, to me, it can't be a night creature because night creatures don't make that type of sound when you're moving around. So it's, something is out there that um, they're afraid of at the very least. So I'm hoping we get to see what that is at some point this season. The other thing is what Henry himself pointed out when he was taking a stroll through the town, when he was looking at the um, buildings. And Ethan said, well, what are you looking at? And Henry mentioned that, well, we have a hotel sign, but there's no hotel here anywhere. So what that makes me think is that there is somebody somewhere that changes the setting or the environment of the town. I don't know what triggers that happening, but at some point the hotel was there. So it seems like eventually maybe when this population is wiped out, 
the town is switched around at, at, at some point. Hotels are added, new buildings, and then a new group of people come in for, let's say, a new experiment. That's the only thing I can think of. So I'm wondering when Victor was the only survivor, a good question to ask him was would be when he came out from hiding, was there anything new in the town besides all those bodies laid out there? Was there any new buildings? Uh, that I would be very, very interested to know. Because then that leads more toward the idea of this being some type of experiment that some entity is doing on people, almost the equivalent of, um, I guess, when, you know, if you're for people who want a biblical reference, when God let Satan attack Job with all these various calamities, maybe there's something like that going on where Uh, a evil spirit has gotten the ability to snatch people and put them in these situations to uh, terrorize them. And at that point, he's using this as his playground with different uh, set pieces to use to put people in these situations. So something to keep an eye on, but that did stick out to me when Henry said that. Uh, last thing I wanted to discuss, you know, Scott covered it very well in our interview, but to me, the biggest and most important scene besides Boyd going off on everybody would be the reunion that Victor had with his son. I think it was an amazing scene between Scott McCord and also uh, Robert Joy. I like the fact that through most of the episode, they were kind of circling each other. You know, they wouldn't, they weren't meeting, they didn't have the immediate big meeting at the uh, opening of the episode. Victor didn't want that initially. So it almost reminded me of kind of how like if you have pets and you're bringing in the new animal to the environment, you keep the pets separate so they can smell each other before they eventually meet. So it's not as shocking. That's how it felt with me. You know, Henry is going around meeting people that know Victor. Don is taking him to his room. So he's getting a feel of the man that Victor is, as opposed to the child that he remembered leaving. So he has a better understanding of the grown man that he's meeting again, that's still his child, but not a child anymore, now an adult. And on Victor's end, being so apprehensive of not feeling like he's enough for his father. And we've all had those feelings of not being enough and being insecure. But as soon as he felt his father's touch, you know, Scott, the way he played it, You know, Victor seems so child, like he reverted back to that child, uh, feeling his father's love again after all of these decades. So I'm very interested to see where Victor goes from here. Does he get more childlike with his father here or does that embolden him to become stronger and to look more for answers like he's been doing, trying to go after finding Jasper and getting answers? I think uh, Henry is going to be along, along for that ride. I don't see him ever... leaving Victor's side again, especially after they've been separated all these decades. The other person to keep in mind is Sarah, because if you look at that scene at the reunion, when it expands out and shows them holding each other, the only other person in that setting is Sarah. So I think it's going to be a trio, Sarah, Victor, and Henry working together to find a solution about Jasper. And Sarah, to me, is changing as far as her role. We're used to her having a, a brother-sister relationship with her brother while he was there, and then with Ethan for a little bit, even though she tried to kill him, and also a sisterly type of uh, relationship she's trying to develop with Julie. But the situation with Victor is a little bit different. Just the way that she's dressed, the way that she talks to him, the way that she kind of dotes on him, looks very concerned when he's having those emotional moments. It's very motherly to me, you know, despite her being so young. That's the type of tone that she takes when she's around Victor. So I wonder if she's going to be like continually be continuing to be that surrogate type of mother for the remainder of the uh, season. So keep an eye on that because that's the role I see her playing as Victor continues his journey to finding Jasper. Uh, so overall, a very strong episode. I do appreciate that they didn't hot shot. throwing Randall in there as the immediate vocal adversary to Boyd to kind of slowly creeping out along. Randall has to recover. We'll see how long he's out of commission. I'm expecting um, Acosta to visit him at some point because I still do think he's going to come up with a faction uh, and be, at least be a wild card even more than he was before because of Boyd leaving him. Uh, but I do think the townspeople, at least for the next episode or two, are going to be held in check by Dale's death. So I think Boyd has a little bit more leeway there. But I think the next big thing is finding out uh, 
these mysteries or you know these entities that we haven't got a handle on who's walking around outside at night and Jasper. Those are the two people I want to see more about in the next episode. And also the decayed lady. That's three entities right there that we don't know anything about whether they're benevolent or malevolent. So there's three right there and that's not even counting the night creatures who we know is evil and we have no idea who even created the night creatures. So between those four, I think we need at least two answers there before the season is out. And that's even separate from, I'm hoping Jade is going to figure out something about the bottles and the faraway tree. I think Jade needs to have that big revelation. I've been talking all season that Jade needs a big win, you know, as far as like opening some or cracking some secret here. He's poised to do that before the season is out. So I think at the halfway point, we're really at a good narrative point here. I think there's a lot that they can accomplish over the last five episodes. And like what Scott said, he says the ending is going to be very strong. So I'm looking forward to a strong episode 10. I know we're weeks away, but that's what I'm already focused on. Because Ricky He, who plays Kenny, who I interviewed, I believe it was episode two, if you go back and look at my our reviews. He also mentioned that the last episode is going to pull the veil back and answer some of our questions, which I think is important because here we are at season three. There needs to be some answers to continually uh, keep people engaged. I think if we have another cliffhanger without any answers, it's going to subconsciously make people start tuning out. So we need, I think, at least two big reveals by the time we get to the finale. But I'm going to end it there. I thank you for tuning into the interview with Scott. Uh, listening to my recap, I want to hear your thoughts on where you feel we're at at the midpoint of season three. Is there anything that you want them to touch on more? Anything that you feel that they dropped the ball on? Because we do have an ensemble cast. So anytime you have that, I think some people are going to get are not going to get the attention that we want, especially if it's one of the characters we like. But I think they balance everything pretty well. I think the characters who have storylines that aren't as strong, like Jim, you know, people like that. They've kind of had them in the background, which I think is appropriate. Now, if they move forward in the second half of the season, that's fine. But I don't think their storylines have been strong enough where they needed to dominate the majority of the first half of the season. But I think things are wide open for the second half. And I think we're going to have a very strong uh, season finale. And hopefully a season four, you know, once you start to get to season three and four, you know, networks start canceling stuff at the drop of a dime, particularly when they're trying to save money. But I think From is this type of show where we need at least five seasons to wrap everything up. I think if it goes beyond five seasons, it start getting the issues that happen with uh, with loss. So I think four to five is a good sweet point to get everything resolved with this show. So fingers crossed there. But thanks again for tuning in. I will be back next week to cover episode six. And just a reminder, these recaps will normally uh, go up in the 1 a.m. Eastern time uh, hour after the episode airs on the uh, MGM Plus uh, website. You know, you have the midnight premiere. So immediately after that, if you're an early watcher, you can come on here and watch the episode. If not, I promise not to have like a spoiler type of thumbnail or comments. You can always come back after uh, 9 p.m. and watch it, and, you know, watch our review and join the discussion after it airs on regular MGM Plus TV. All right, but take care. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and have a great uh, coming week. Take care.